Due to the graphic nature of this woman's crimes, listener discretion is advised. This episode includes discussions of murder, abuse, and assault that some people may find offensive. We advise extreme caution for children under the age of 13. It was the mid-1970s in Medellin, Colombia. After much pleading, a young carjacker convinced a smuggler friend to introduce him to the biggest cocaine distributor in town. The smuggler agreed to bring the carjacker to a cockfight later that week. The carjacker, with the brashness that comes with youth, thought he had a good chance to convince her to take him into her employ. At the fight, the carjacker pushed through the crowd, eager to find her. The closer he got to the center of the ring, the wealthier the crowd became. At last, he spotted her. She was perhaps 30 and had a striking appearance. She wore diamonds and silk, and a thick phalanx of bodyguards surrounded her. The carjacker spotted the pistol she always carried with ease. She never tried to hide it. He tried to explain that the smuggler had vouched for him, that he was supposed to meet her but they didn't listen. Then she spoke. She had heard the carjacker drop the name of the smuggler and recalled that she was, indeed, supposed to meet with this young man. He knew this was his one chance. To make it in with her would propel him to the top. He introduced himself. Pablo Escobar. She nodded, making a mental note of the name for the future. And she introduced herself as well, as though he wouldn't have been able to pick her out of a crowded street. Griselda Blanco. Hi, I'm Claire. And I'm Vanessa. And you're listening to Female Criminals, a new show by Parcast. Today, we're talking about Griselda Blanco, the madrina of Colombian cocaine one of the first big players in the lucrative and dangerous drug trade of the 1970s. She left an enormous body count in her wake, made up of both gruesome murders and drug overdoses. Before we get started, we'd like to ask you a quick favor. Would you leave a five-star review of Female Criminals on your favorite podcast directory? It seems so simple, but it really helps us out. And don't forget to subscribe while you're there, because a new episode comes out every Wednesday. You can also find us on Facebook and Instagram as at Parcast and on Twitter as at Parcast Network. You might be wondering why we would devote an entire new show to showcasing specifically female criminals. Well, there are a couple of reasons. For starters, when the Parcast team started researching female crime, We were shocked to find how many interesting stories haven't been told. Stories of female serial killers, drug lords, cult leaders. The list goes on and on. These stories are remarkable, and we quickly started to wonder about the psychology behind these crimes and how they differ from other crimes and, quite frankly, podcast shows. Sure enough, we felt the psychology was equally or even more fascinating than the stories. Thus, Female Criminals was born. So with that out of the way, let's get started. Griselda Blanco was born in Cartagena, Colombia on February 15, 1943. Her mother, Ana Lucia Restrepo, was a farm worker. Some sources list Griselda's father as Fernando Blanco, which would account for her last name. Jenny Aaron Smith, author of the Griselda Blanco biography, Cocaine Cowgirl, says that her name comes from taxi driver Luis Carlos Blanco, who was either her father or stepfather. Ana Lucia and Griselda didn't stay in Cartagena for long. Griselda was baptized in Santa Marta, just four hours up the coast from Cartagena. They moved to Medellin in 1946, when Griselda was three years old. Ana Lucia may have been pregnant with one of Griselda's three younger siblings, though we don't know very much about any of them. They lived in Medellin's Barrio Trinidad, a poor and crowded neighborhood filled with migrant workers from the Caribbean islands. 
It is possible that Ana Lucia chose this neighborhood because it was known for its large number of brothels. In 1948, when Griselda was five years old, the leader of the Colombian Liberal Party was assassinated in broad daylight in Bogota, Colombia's capital city. This kicked off a violent three-day uprising in Bogota and began the decade-long civil war known as La Violencia that ripped through all of Colombia. It's not easy to sum up a 10-year war in a couple of sentences, but suffice it to say that the Liberal Party and the Conservative Party both raised paramilitary forces to fight against each other and against the Communist Party. This left Colombia in a state of ruin, with millions of civilians displaced out of fear. Casualties ranged from two to three hundred thousand, with around six to eight hundred thousand injured in the fighting. For reference, Colombia's total population was only around 10 million in 1946. Mm. The majority of Griselda's childhood, ages 5 through 15, took place in a war-torn country with a national baseline of fear so high that even the media was afraid to report accurately for fear of retribution by one side or the other. Before we start to delve into Griselda's psychology, I just want to give a brief disclaimer. Vanessa is not a licensed psychologist or psychiatrist, but she has done a lot of research for this show. So let's talk about children who grow up in war zones for a moment. A paper published in Psychology Today entitled The Invisible Trauma of War Affected Children discussed the effects of being raised in such an unstable and dangerous environment on a child's psyche. Robert T. Mueller, the author of the paper, wrote that, quote, children living in violent, terrorized environments live in circumstances where they make critical survival decisions to hide under deceased remains of others, to kill or be killed, and often live through situations where they believe they will die. Children like Griselda were often forced to grow up too fast, experiencing the same kind of trauma shared by many soldiers returning from war. And this amount of violence was often overwhelming for children who grew up experiencing it as the new normal. Dr. Harith Hassan, a child psychologist studying in Iraq, said of children in long-term war zones, quote, This violence is all some of them think about and know. The dangers are that they will internalize the violence and then reproduce it later, end quote in the same way that children of domestic abuse sometimes grew up to be abusers children exposed to violence in war sometimes grew up to become violent and some like Griselda didn't wait to grow up before becoming violent mm. in 1951 the mayor of Medellin declared Barrio Trinidad Griselda's neighborhood the city's official red light district that meant that crime within the city coalesced concentrating within one general location, the boundaries of Barrio Trinidad. Griselda was one of many children who began pickpocketing at a young age, possibly to help her family, possibly for sport. She gathered other young pickpockets to her and created a small gang, acting as their leader. It wasn't long before pickpocketing lost its luster, and in 1954, when Griselda was only 11 years old, she came up with a new plan that she believed would earn them much more money, much more quickly. Here's something we think you'll find interesting. I'm so excited to share that I also host another great ParCast podcast, Unexplained Mysteries. Every week, my co-host Richard and I dig deep into the mysteries of the past and present as we search for answers to the unknown. Claire and Richard are excellent storytellers. You'll be captivated as they explore each mystery using in-depth research and analysis. Thanks, Vanessa. We refuse to take we don't know for an answer. And we'll stop at nothing to find explanations to life's unanswered questions. 
You can listen to episodes on Stonehenge and the Mona Lisa right now. New episodes are released every Thursday, so be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. Search for Unexplained Mysteries on your favorite podcast directory to start listening now. Or visit Parcast, P-A-R-C-A-S-T dot com slash unexplained to listen now. And here's another recommendation for you. Let's be honest, finding the time to get a lab test is almost impossible. Now it's easy to order the tests you want at everlywell.com. Everlywell is an at-home health testing company that offers a variety of tests, including food sensitivity, metabolism, and thyroid testing. All you have to do is visit everlywell.com, choose your tests, and they'll be shipped directly to your doorstep. Once you collect your sample and send it back to Everlywell's certified lab partner, you'll get your results online in days. I was easily able to test myself for food sensitivities thanks to Everlywell. No more sitting in waiting rooms, no more mystery bill, and no more waiting on your results. Head to everlywell.com and use promo code CRIMINALS to take 15% off your first order. That's everlywell.com, promo code CRIMINALS for 15% off your first order. Take control of your health today with Everlywell's at-home health tests. Your test on your time and on your terms. Now let's get back to the story. 11-year-old Griselda Blanco and her gang kidnapped a 10-year-old boy from a wealthier neighborhood in Medellin around the year 1954. We don't know how Griselda selected her captive, or even whether she knew him, but according to a paper published in the Journal of the Royal Society of Medicine, most of the kidnappings in Colombia during the height of the later cocaine wars were for financial reasons, like extortion. Griselda may have scoped out her victim based on where he lived and on whether she felt that she and her gang could overpower him physically. Griselda's gang tied him up and held him captive in the hills beyond Medellin. Griselda demanded a ransom from his parents, but they declined to pay it. Perhaps they didn't think this gang of children was serious. But they were very serious, or at least Griselda was. When she received word that her gang would not be receiving the ransom, she pulled out a gun and shot the younger boy dead. Again, she was only 11 years old. This was her first murder, but it was not her last. Unfortunately, we don't have much information on child murderers in Colombia, but in the United States, child murderers are extremely rare. According to Psychology Today, child murderers make up less than 1% of all homicides, and under 2% of those murders are committed by children up to age 11. Griselda's first murder happened astoundingly early in her life. But she hadn't intended for it to be a murder. It was just supposed to be a kidnapping. But it doesn't necessarily matter what it was supposed to be. What matters is that it became a murder, and it did so by Griselda's hand. The fact that she was willing to step in and do the dirty work herself speaks to the psychology behind belonging to a gang. A paper on the psychology of gang members from the University of Kent showed that kids in gangs valued social status more than non-gang youth. Maybe she did it to save face in front of her peers when she wasn't able to get the desired ransom money. Or perhaps she did it to show the other kids in her gang that she was capable of murder, that she deserved to be in charge because of how far she was willing to go. In any case, it wasn't long after this 1954 murder that Griselda may have started a short career in the sex work industry. This is something Griselda herself denied for her whole life, but many of our sources mention it as a part of her early life story. In fact, several sources list sex work as the way Griselda met the man who became her first husband. Mm, sources vary on whether his name was Carlos Trujillo or Jose Dario Trujillo, but Trujillo took a liking to the 13-year-old Griselda when they met around 1956. Author Jenny Aaron Smith wrote in Cocaine Cowgirls that Trujillo was a car washer nicknamed Pestañas, or eyelashes, 
for his most distinctive feature. He may have been one of Griselda's Johns. One thing we know for sure is that he was a forger and a smuggler. Trujillo was known around Medellin for fabricating immigration papers and helping Colombians across the U.S. border illegally. Maybe what Griselda saw in Trujillo was a way out of the poverty and crime in which she had grown up. Hmm. Or perhaps she saw a way to dig in deeper to Colombia's growing criminal underworld. Around 1957, when Griselda was 14, she ran away from home. An article from the Huffington Post suggests that it was due to sexual abuse at the hands of one of her mother's boyfriends. It can be very difficult for survivors of abuse to leave, particularly abuse that occurs within the home. Perhaps Griselda felt she had somewhere she could go and left for the relative safety of a life with Trujillo. It's also possible that Griselda's mother found out about the abuse and kicked Griselda out of the house. Sadly, according to Psychology Today, some children who reveal abuse to a parent or guardian are blamed for seducing the perpetrator or are accused of lying. Regardless of why she left, we know that sometime in the next few years, she and Trujillo married and started building a family together. She and Trujillo had three sons, but the dates are a bit fuzzy. Griselda was either 17 or 19 when she gave birth to their first son, Dixon. Uber followed two years later, and Oswaldo came along four years after that. All we can say with certainty is that they were born over the course of the 1960s. But Griselda wasn't just playing a mother. She was also helping Trujillo expand his forgery and smuggling operations until they divorced in the late 1960s. But divorce wasn't legal in Colombia at the time, which implies that either they were never really married or that they only separated. At least until Trujillo's untimely death in 1970, Cocaine Cowgirl attributes the death to hepatitis, but other sources suggest that Griselda may have had Trujillo killed. If that's true, perhaps it was in order to get closer to Trujillo's friend, Alberto Bravo. We don't know much about Bravo's life before Griselda, but we know that he and his brother Carlos were part of a drug trafficking operation. Bravo's business was just as shady as Trujillo's had been, but had much wider-reaching consequences, both for the world and for Griselda's own future. Alberto Bravo's trade was converting old factories into cocaine processing labs. Cocaine comes from the coca plant, native to South America. Indigenous peoples in places like Peru have chewed coca leaves as a stimulant and an anesthetic for at least a thousand years. Cocaine is a chemical compound that occurs naturally within coca leaves. Isolated in the 19th century as an alkaloid, cocaine was originally used for medicinal purposes. It quickly became a fad, with cocaine and coca leaves appearing in food, drink, and quack remedies. Cocaine use spiked among upper and middle classes, as evidenced by fictional detective Sherlock Holmes indulging in cocaine injections when bored. But the United States first started cracking down on cocaine and other recreational drugs in the Pure Food and Drug Act of 1906, with further laws introducing additional restrictions. In 1970, the United States enacted the Controlled Substances Act and cocaine became completely illegal to use outside of strict medical use. At the time, U.S. law enforcement was more interested in heroin's effect on the populace, while Colombia's illegal drug trade focused more on marijuana. That meant there was plenty of room for someone like Alberto Bravo to come in and provide a covert illicit supply of cocaine to buyers in the United States for huge amounts of money. According to Cocaine Cowgirl, in 1970, Griselda and a female friend flew out to Bolivia with $500. This money may have been a loan from Bravo, 
or it may have been from Griselda's savings, we're not sure. But we do know that they spent that 500 on unrefined cocaine to smuggle back into Colombia for Bravo to further refine at one of his converted factories. It's kind of incredible that Griselda would take this kind of risk, especially with three young children to care for. The cocaine business was illegal in Colombia as well. If she got arrested, there wasn't anyone else who would take care of the children. Right, which may explain why she felt like she had to do this. Remember, her first husband, Trujillo, wasn't alive anymore. She was the only provider for her children at this point, which may have had something to do with the amount of risk she was willing to take. Her other options may have been limited to sex work, which obviously comes with its own amount of risk. This was the first of several trips to Bolivia for Griselda, who started taking these trips alone, without a companion. Her second trip, she flew out with $5,000 and brought back 10 times as much cocaine. Griselda may have started as a drug mule for Bravo, but she quickly developed a partnership with him. She wasn't interested in being someone's subordinate, and together they both led this emerging cartel. Technically, any cartel that worked out of Medellin could be said to belong to the Medellin cartel. But Griselda and Bravo's operation was not the same as the one run by Pablo Escobar in the 70s and 80s. The DEA believed that, at their height, Griselda and Bravo had at least 600 people in their employ. But their partnership wasn't just business. It became a romantic one as well. She married Alberto Bravo in 1971. By that time, Bravo had about $26,000 to his name, enough that Griselda could feel secure about her future and her family's future. For reference, 26,000 American dollars in 1970 is the equivalent of about 170,000 today. So Griselda dove into the cocaine business with gusto and with plenty of ideas. Together, she and Bravo expanded his business into the U.S. They may have been the first people to export Colombian cocaine into the United States, and they were certainly the first to do it with a base set up in Medellin. They were able to move these amounts of cocaine into the country with the help of drug mules. These were people who would board planes with drugs in Medellin, trade those drugs for cash in New York, and fly that cash back to Medellin. What was interesting about the way Griselda smuggled drugs into the United States and money into Colombia was that she primarily hired female mules. There were exceptions, of course. All three of her sons were involved in the trade, and they knew to pack cocaine and money behind the lining of their hard-shelled suitcases. Children were practically invisible and weren't as likely to get caught as an adult male. The same went for women. Griselda understood that women were routinely overlooked, both by drug lords and by police, as valuable employees within her industry. She and Bravo set up an undergarment factory and shop where they sold high-end lingerie. They set up house in Queens, New York, and called themselves clothing importers. But behind the scenes, they were also using the skills of underemployed tailors to create garments and devices that could be used to transport cocaine discreetly. They made wigs, girdles, bras, shoes, all with secret compartments that would allow a mule to board a plane with minimal suspicion. Not that every mule made it past security. As the tabloid The Sun reported, quote, In 1971, one of Griselda Blanco's infamous cocaine corsets was discovered abandoned in a woman's bathroom at Miami International Airport. It contained almost seven pounds of the drug, which had been sewn into 58 separate compartments. Fake breasts were filled with two large packets of coke, end quote. It's terrifying to think that so much cocaine made it into the country and was simply abandoned as an acceptable loss. What's more terrifying, though, is the level of loyalty that Griselda's mules had for her. To quote the son again, in 1972, one of Blanco's mules, 33-year-old Mariela Zapata, 
was caught by customs officials at the same airport with four and a half pounds of pure cocaine in her underwear, with a street value of over $115,000. Even though Sabata was charged with unlawful importation of cocaine and deported to a Colombian prison, she refused to reveal her boss, end quote. Drug mules could make a lot of money, and some cartels took care of the families of those who were caught and imprisoned. And some women may have done it for the same reason Griselda may have started in the business. Even with its risks, being a drug mule felt safer and more rewarding than sex work. So you're saying that these women were either grateful for the opportunity, or that they simply understood that their families might be provided for. Mm -hmm. I'm saying that they're both possible. These women, like many of the people who worked for Griselda, began to refer to her as La Madrina, or the Godmother. The role of a godparent in the Catholic Church was to bear witness to a child's baptism and to help bring them up in the faith. It was a supportive role, one designed to exist in concert with a child's birth parents. A godparent supported the child, the parents, and the church in general. Perhaps these women saw Griselda as a supportive person within their lives, someone who helped them provide for their families. Or perhaps they felt that Griselda had bore witness to their descent into criminality and had helped bring them deeper into the Medellin underworld. Or maybe they saw the 1972 film The Godfather, a cinematic masterpiece centering on the criminal dealings of the Italian mafia. Griselda is noted for having really loved the Godfather films, so maybe that's the explanation that makes the most sense. In any case, by this point in 1972, Griselda and Bravo set up a system of distribution with drop-off points in four of the New York City boroughs, Manhattan, Brooklyn, Queens, and the Bronx. They paid off associates who worked within the offices of the Colombian consulate, laundered their money in banks throughout the tri-state area, and had at least one full-time forger on their payroll. Griselda also established a vice grip on the Medellin airport. She paid off everyone involved with air travel, both to make sure that her mules could get onto the planes with minimal fuss, and to make sure that other drug smugglers couldn't compete with her. You can't move your product if you can't literally move your product out of the country. Both Bravo and Griselda traveled to New York with some frequency, but Bravo spent more time there than she did. Though she always retained an office in her childhood neighborhood of Barrio Trinidad, Griselda bought a house for herself and her sons in Laurelis, a wealthier neighborhood in Medellin. Perhaps it's even the same neighborhood where the 10-year-old boy she killed was from. She and Bravo didn't live together. Their marriage may have been one of convenience, a business partnership more than anything else. Or perhaps they were both fiercely independent people who valued their time apart. Either way, they both benefited from their time together. It's estimated that they moved about $1 million worth of cocaine every six months at this point. If you know much about the later cocaine trade, this might not sound like much. But remember that this was the early years of the cocaine trade. Griselda was still building the infrastructure that could support a larger base of operations. And Griselda continued to grow her business without interruption until 1973, when the United States formed the Drug Enforcement Agency, or the DEA to put a stop to the importation of illegal drugs onto American soil. Time to share something we are thrilled about. If you're wondering what to listen to next, you should check out the audiobook edition of The Wife Between Us by Greer Hendricks and Sarah Pekinen. The Wife Between Us is the New York Times bestseller that everyone is talking about. You may assume this is the story of a perfect relationship with a jealous ex-wife who wants to ruin it all. You may assume you understand the motives of the characters, their histories, and their relationships. But assume nothing, because this psychological thriller is full of twists that will keep you guessing. And the narrator, Julia Whelan, 
makes the story sound that much more twisted and chilling. Take this story with you on your commute, while you clean, or out for a long run. You won't want to press pause. Start listening now at macmillanaudio.com slash wife between us. Now let's get back to the story. Griselda Blanco and Alberto Bravo's operation finally came into focus with the DEA's research. They realized that the scale of the business out of Medellin would mean their first major cocaine case. They called the case Operation Banshee on account of how many women were involved in the business. Around this point, maybe late 1973 or early 1974, Griselda and Bravo no longer needed individual mules to do all of their smuggling for them. They began to enlarge their business with the help of literal boatloads of cocaine. The New York Times reported female pilots flying in kilos upon kilos of cocaine into the country. Elaine Carey, a narcotics trade historian, said in Cocaine Cowgirl that, quote, there were even reports of frogmen who were swimming in waterproof cases underwater. They were jumping off ships and swimming the stuff in, end quote. Federal agents put out arrest warrants for Griselda and Bravo in October of 1974. According to the New York Times, they arrested at least 150 people connected with the cartel that same month. But Griselda and Bravo didn't fully exit New York until early 1975, when the government indicted them and several high-ranking people in their organization arresting 15. They fled back to Medellin, where Griselda still controlled the city's cocaine production and shipment. She was able to continue her operation in the United States from afar. It was around this time that Griselda was introduced to a young carjacker named Pablo Escobar. Pablo was about seven years younger than Griselda, 25 to her 32 in 1975. He also grew up in Medellin, and he had experience with kidnapping and ransoming, bodyguarding, stealing cars, and resanding gravestones stolen from local cemeteries. Now he was looking to get into the cocaine business, and he knew that Griselda was the best, or the only, person in town to approach about an opening. Pablo set up a meeting through his smuggler friend, who sent him to a cockfight that Griselda was known to frequent. We don't know what they talked about or what it was that Griselda saw in young Pablo. Maybe he was just one in a long line of fresh young faces who wanted to work with her. Perhaps, in this moment, he was just one face in the crowd. But in any case, she decided to take a chance on Pablo and work with him. Griselda provided the cash for Pablo's first purchase of cocaine, and he entered the business with his brother Roberto and a small group of trusted associates. Eventually, Pablo's operation became known as the Medellin Cartel. But for the time being, it was just one of many offshoots of Griselda's larger business. And for a little while, things were good. Until they weren't. We don't know what happened between Griselda and Pablo, but we know that the relationship soured pretty quickly. From what Jenny Aaron Smith wrote in Cocaine Cowgirl, it sounds like they both grew to resent each other's successes. Pablo didn't want to work under the umbrella of this larger organization, particularly not one run by a woman, which is actually quite common. An article from the Personality and Social Psychology Bulletin suggests that men who have female bosses or employers can sometimes see the dynamic as a, quote, threat to their masculinity, whether they consciously acknowledge it or not. And Griselda didn't like having to share her resources with someone who was earning more than she was. Because Pablo Escobar was on his way to becoming the wealthiest drug lord of all time. And Griselda, though she would have received the regulated kickbacks from Pablo's team, may have wanted it more. Studies focused on social dominance theory showed that bosses who value their position within a company hierarchy too often see high-performing employees as a threat. So one day, she invited Pablo to a meeting. When he arrived, he realized that the license plates on all of the cars were blocked out. 
this was a setup. He ran and he lived. Griselda and Pablo both tried to set up each other's assassination over the course of the rest of their lives. The structure of Griselda's and Pablo's respective cartels and how they each dealt with rivals hedging in on their territory harkens back to those earlier days of La Violencia, when the paramilitary organizations tore across Colombia. It makes sense. They both grew up during the Colombian Civil War, and the structure of those paramilitary groups was the closest thing to government many people saw. The big difference would have been that the paramilitary groups were presumably fighting for an ideal, while Griselda's and Pablo's men were fighting for their leaders. This war with Pablo Escobar may have been what inspired Griselda to pioneer a new type of execution that was used in the drug wars for decades to come. Many mafia-style executions, when they involved rivals, took the form of shootouts. A driver and a hitman would pull up beside the target's car. The hitman would shoot the target through the window. The driver would flee. It's a perfect crime, unless there's traffic. Cocaine Cowgirl details how police caught up with two of Griselda's men after a shootout and arrested them, all because her men got stuck in a traffic jam. Griselda realized that the easiest way to solve this problem would be to use a vehicle that didn't need to stop in traffic, a motorcycle. It still required two people, a driver and a hitman, but it was so much easier to zoom off into the distance on an easy-to-maneuver motorcycle than a large, bulky car. Unfortunately for Griselda, she was never able to use this method to assassinate Pablo, and in 1975, Pablo's men were able to drive Griselda and her husband and partner, Alberto Bravo, out of Medellin. They fled eight hours southeast to the relative safety of Bogota, the capital of Colombia. This must have felt like a shock to Griselda. Getting kicked out of New York City was one thing. The United States had never been her home. But Medellin was her home, her turf. She owned this place, and it molded her into the woman she became. Leaving it with no knowledge of when it would be safe to return may have been devastating. So there she was, a woman on the run, tossed out of her home turf by a young upstart. She risked losing everything. Though Griselda wasn't a refugee, it's possible that she may have felt like one. The Helen Bamber Foundation said that refugees and other displaced people may have a harder time forming connections with or growing to trust others. That could help explain why she had Alberto Bravo's brother killed around this time. Griselda was said to have become more paranoid after leaving Medellin, suspecting the people close to her of working with her enemy, Pablo Escobar. Presumably, Alberto's brother had made some sort of mistake that Griselda felt was inexcusable or unforgivable. I can't imagine that that improved her relationship with Alberto Bravo. Mm, neither can I. From what we can tell, the relationship was strained in general. The murder of Bravo's brother may have added to their relationship troubles, or it may have been the cause. Bravo may have grown suspicious of his own future with Griselda, or at least of the prospect of living out the rest of his life with her. It's believed that he began to skim money from their shared business tucking it away for himself for later use. Mm, a Maxim article claims that Bravo skimmed millions of their shared profits. And apparently, Bravo thought that Griselda was taking the La Madrina stuff a little too seriously. Either one of these seems like it wouldn't go over very well with Griselda, but both at once seems dangerous. And it was. Later, in 1975... Alberto Bravo was killed in a shootout outside of a nightclub in Bogota. Officially, no one saw it. At least, no one was willing to go on record and have their name associated with their testimony about what happened. Some people, including Griselda herself, say that it was Pablo Escobar's men who took out Alberto Bravo. But there have always been rumors. Rumors that not only claim Griselda had her husband killed, but that she did it herself. 
Rumor has it that Griselda and Alberto Bravo met in that parking lot to discuss business, each with a small team of bodyguards and enforcers at the ready. By this point, it would seem their marriage dissolved as quickly as their business partnership. Griselda began throwing out accusations, saying that Bravo stole money from their business. Bravo denied it, saying that Griselda had become too arrogant within their business partnership. Griselda pulled out a pistol and shot at him. She was finally done with the man she'd been in bed with, literally and figuratively, for over five years at this point. Bravo's response was to pull out a submachine gun and open fire on his wife. After a tense shootout between Griselda, Bravo, and each of their enforcers, Bravo and his bodyguards all lay dead on the pavement. But again, this is only a rumor. Griselda denied ever killing her husband. She even denied ever being shot, although, according to Cocaine Cowgirl, her autopsy revealed an old bullet wound in Griselda's abdomen. Perhaps it had come to Griselda courtesy of her late second husband. But one thing she definitely gained from this shootout, regardless of the truth of what really happened there that night, was a new nickname. With husbands number one and two both dead, presumably by her hand, Griselda Blanco was now called the Black Widow. But this wasn't the last time she murdered someone who she supposedly loved. Griselda's executions were about to get more brutal, more numerous, and much more publicly visible. Thanks for tuning in to Female Criminals. Next week, we'll talk about Griselda's third marriage and fourth son, her bloody and brutal takeover of the Miami cocaine scene, her arrests during the Miami drug wars, and her own ironic murder by motorcycle. If you want to listen to any future episodes of Female Criminals, you can find them on Apple Podcasts, TuneIn, Google Play, Stitcher, and Spotify, or on our website, parcast.com, spelled P-A-R-C-A-S-T dot com. If you like what you hear, please leave a five-star review or tell us what you think on social media. We're on Facebook and Instagram as at Parcast and Twitter at Parcast Network. It seems really simple, but it really helps our show. Join us next Wednesday as we continue to explore the mind and murders of Griselda Blanco. Female Criminals was created by Max Cutler, is a production of Cutler Media, and is part of the Parcast Network. It is produced by Max and Ron Cutler, sound designed by Ron Shapiro, with production assistance by Paul Mahler. Additional production assistance by Carly Madden and Maggie Admire. Female Criminals is written by Dana Shaw and stars Claire Delamar and Vanessa Richardson. Finding the time to get a lab test is almost impossible. Everly Well is an at-home health testing company that offers a variety of physician-reviewed private tests, from food sensitivity to metabolism to thyroid. No more sitting in waiting rooms or waiting on your results. Head to everlywell.com and use promo code CRIMINALS to take 15% off your first order. Everly Well, your test on your time and on your terms. We are thrilled to launch Female Criminals, but we need your help. We want to work with advertisers that our listeners will love, so we need to learn a little more about you. Please visit podsurvey.com slash criminals to take a short anonymous survey. Once you've completed the survey, you can enter to win a $100 Amazon gift card. Again, that's podsurvey.com slash criminals. Thanks for your help.